So today's presentation is going to be on using C functions and libraries from Chapel. So just a couple of words about Chapel itself. Uh, since you are in this webinar, I assume you already know a lot about, well, you know, something about Chapel. So we started using Chapel three years ago in various workshops and summer schools. And the reason we do this is because it's a parallel programming language for the high performance computing environment for clusters. And it was written with parallelism in mind from scratch. So it has both uh, uh, shared memory and distributed memory parallelism built in. So it's really fantastic language, very high level, very easy to use and to learn. So if you compare uh, Chapel to things like uh, MPI, MPI is a lot more uh, difficult, a lot more uh, low level. You'll spend a lot more uh, time programming and debugging codes in MPI. So in that regard, Chapel is really great. So, and then Chapel has this multi-resolution philosophy. Uh, meaning that uh, if you don't want code a lot, you want uh, just put in a few lines of uh, parallel code in, in, into your program, uh, well, you can just do that. But if you want to optimize performance and to make it, uh, you know, as, as high performing as, as MPI, uh, then you can, you can also do that. Uh, so uh, it just, you just, you know, you, you, you put more, uh, more things, more chapel uh, uh, parallel things into your code and it will become, it will become a little bit faster. So uh, in Chapel, the focus is really on performance. Uh, despite being a high level language like Python, it's a compiled language. So you compile the code in Chapel. And it gets, uh, first of all, when you're compiling it, uh, the Chapel compiler will uh, translate your code into C. And then the C compiler will uh, convert it into a machine binary. Uh, so Chapel is supposed to uh, run about as fast as any other compiled language. So C, C++, Fortran. And uh, reportedly for very complex codes, Chapel performs roughly at 70% speed of, of a well-tuned uh, similar MPI code. But here we're talking about large-scale large, uh, large scale, uh, parallel simulations like galaxy formation or you know, weather modeling, et cetera. But it's supposed to be fast, although there is a little bit of uh, room of improvement in Chapel itself. And so we've been teaching it, uh, we've been using it for teaching the basic concepts of parallel programming for the past three years. And my, my view is that Chapel is really by far the best language to teach uh, various concepts of parallel programming, so shared memory parallelism, distributed memory parallelism uh, in a single workshop. Uh, Chapel, uh, so Chapel is open source. It was uh, started and still hosted by Cray, a uh, supercomputer, but it's really an open source project. So there are uh, contributors um, all over the world. And uh, it's written for Unix-like platforms. So that means that if you are on, uh, let's say, Unix laptop, a Mac, a Mac or a, a Linux box, then you can just uh, install it locally. Uh, when you compile it locally on a Unix laptop, you will not have access to all uh, multi local features or so multi-node features of Chapel, because by definition, you just have a single box, single laptop with uh, multiple cores. But if you want, you can actually simulate a cluster environment inside your laptop with a specially prepared uh, Chapel Docker image. So we just follow the link in the slides and uh, and uh, install Docker. And that way you can actually run Chapel not just on Mac and Linux, but also on a Windows machine. Of course, we have Chapel installed on HPC classes. So I'll show you where to find it in, in a couple of slides. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned the slides for this presentation can be you know, found at the bottom, uh, at the bottom of each slide. So hopefully this one is big enough you can see it. And uh, you can also find these slides if you go to westgrid.ca, follow the link for training materials website. And on training materials website, go to programming tab. And in the table of contents, find chapel. And uh, there you will, find, you will find these slides. OK. So uh, just a couple of examples of uh, chapel codes. Uh, so as I mentioned, chapel has uh, built-in parallelism. It has uh, built-in task parallelism and data parallelism. So the distinction is, is fairly obvious. With task parallelism, you schedule individual tasks yourself, and then it's up to you. So in your code, you tell Chapel what each task is supposed to be doing, right? So it's kind of manual, uh, low-level programming. And here are a couple of examples. So task parallelism, the first uh, row. Uh, on the left, you have a single locale. So locale in Chapel is a node, right? So single locale means single node, shared, uh, shared memory uh, pro program. And on the right, we have multiple locales, multiple nodes. So that means uh, both distributed and shared memory program. Uh, so on the left, we have in, in task parallel, uh, we have an example where we schedule two tasks, the so number of tasks is equal to two. And then each, we simply a cycle uh, through, through all tasks and call for all loop will launch a new thread for each uh, loop iteration. 
And then simply each, each uh, thread is, is printing its, its task ID or thread ID. On the right, we are also cycling manually through all the cards, all nodes that, um, that we have access to in a shuffle code. And then on each locale, we are printing its name, right? So in both cases, we are doing kind of manual uh, manual uh, uh, task, uh, we're scheduling tasks manually. Uh, whereas at the bottom, in the bottom row, data parallel programming means that you have a data structure that is parallel, and then you're basically throwing your data structure at uh, a chapel and ask it to parallelize it using all the resources that are available. So if you're on a single node, then it will uh, use multiple processes that are available to you in, in your job or on your laptop. And then in this case, we have a one-dimensional array that has a thousand elements, array of rails, and then we're simply cycling through, actually there are three arrays. We're cycling through all elements in all three arrays at, at the same time. And then uh, uh, C, the, so the first element of C is the sum of the first element of A and B and, and so on for all of them. So if uh, these arrays A, B, C are sufficiently large, then Chapel will break uh, this code into multiple threads uh, and the number of threads will be exactly the same as the number of processes that are available to you in, in your current environment. And in the right corner, in the right bottom corner, multiple accounts data parallel, we have a data structure that is a two-dimensional, so this is a two-dimensional mesh, 100 by 100, and mesh is just a mesh, right? So it has no numbers in it. And then on top of this mesh, we have a, an array T, let's say an array of temperatures, that is an array of uh, reels, so single precision, and it's 100 by 100, but uh, this array is actually distributed in exactly the same way as the underlying mesh is distributed, so using block structure distribution, which means uh, that, let's say you have a 100 by 100 array. Uh, usually, if you run this, let's say, on four, pro on four nodes, sorry, if you're running this on four nodes, then each node will have a subset of, of the entire array. So on four nodes, typically a corner, there are four corners, and each corner will go will go to a different node. So then the result is that the array T will be uh, will be stored in a distributed way, it will be distributed across across four nodes. And then here we're starting a parallel parallel for loop where simply we're computing the IG element of T and it's just the sum of the two indices. So if you want to know uh, to learn the basic chapel, uh, here, I'm not teaching basic chapel. We actually have quite a lot of materials online, including these uh, webinars, three-part webinar series that I linked from the slides. Uh, it's a couple of years old, but it's still very up-to-date in the sense that we are still using exactly the same materials. So please go and watch it, and that will give you uh, a better idea of uh, the basics of the basic Perl constructs in chapel. So as I mentioned, chapel is installed on our machines on CEDA, Gram, Beluga, uh, the General Purpose Computer Canada clusters. And uh, you can go to the um, Chapel uh, wiki page in our documentation. So there is a single uh, local single node module uh, that is installed on these machines, but it's actually a fairly old one, 1.15. Uh, so what I recommend to use is actually not the modules uh, for Chapel, but uh, these, uh, these uh, startup scripts that I have in my home directory on these uh, three clusters. And the reason I have them is because uh, this special important parallel chapel is because the way you compile and optimize the chapel compiler itself is actually very hardware dependent and it's very different on these three clusters because they have different interconnects and different different drivers. So uh, a few days ago, for example, I was installed I was installing uh, multi-local parallel chapel on Beluga, and even though Beluga has the same infinite bad interconnect, I found that installation is actually quite different from Gram that has a very similar infinite back inter interconnect, but it's just different versions of the drivers and you know slightly different setup, and, and the end result is that the underlying installation is different. But to you, it should appear all the same. So depending on, on one of these clusters, depending on whether you're using single local chapel or multi local chapel, you will just uh, source one of these scripts, just exact, exact line uh, you see on, on the slide, and then you have access to the chapel compiler, and then you'll be able to do everything, everything you want. So as uh, you probably know, Chapel has a fairly small user base. So very few people know Chapel, use Chapel, and this is kind of a chicken and egg situation because uh, very few users means uh, not a lot of developers. So not that many native Chapel libraries. So that means again very few users and so on. So unfortunately, that is that is uh, the current situation with Chapel, even though it's been around for you know since 2009. But fortunately, from Chapel, you can actually use libraries written uh, in other languages, so in C, in Fortran 90, in, in other languages. 
And uh, you can do it in one of two ways. So either you can uh, call the function, let's say function in C, uh, directly from Chapel, and that call will always be serial. Or you can also use high-level Chapel uh, functions, if they exist, that will call uh, some, some like I.O. or linear algebra libraries underneath. So you will see lots and lots of examples for both today. Uh, just a very quick reminder how you can actually uh, code external functions in C. So here we have uh, the main code, driver.c, that uh, calls uh, the function print squared and passes 5 to it. And print squared is defined in a separate C code, uh, so dependency, separate C files with the .c extension. So in this case, you compile it. You can either compile the whole thing together and just build an executable, or you can do a multi-step compilation where from each .c file, you create an object file, and then you take all these object files and link them to, to uh, any library, and then you, you, you build an executable. So in other case, uh, in other case, when you're compiling the uh, main code driver.c, uh, the C compiler has to know that there is a function uh, print square that is defined somewhere else in another in another file. So that's why you have to declare uh, the function prototype uh, before the main code. Otherwise, the compiler will tell you that it has no idea where to find print square. So by prototyping it, you're just telling it that. Uh, this uh, function is defined not in the current file, but in some other file that we will be linked later on when you build the, the binary. So when you do this um, uh, prototyping, you in, in, in uh, C, uh, in the original C, you were supposed to um, use the extern keyword, but nowadays pretty much any compiler will assume uh, this extern uh, keyword by, by default, so you don't have to use it. In Chapel, the idea is very similar. So in Chapel, you have to declare your C code with the external statement. Uh, and in Chapel, all functions uh, and, and subroutines are called procedures. So uh, all uh, C functions must be prototyped as, uh, in Chapel as an external procedure. And then uh, this external prototype is actually quite different from the C prototype. So what I mean is, when you compile the Chapel code into C, uh, your Chapel code, uh, so your, your, your resulting C code uh, will have this function that I'm using from the main code. But uh, this external prototype in Chapel will not be translated automatically into an external prototype in C. So in this case, I have an example where the function is defined inside a, a, a .h file, so the include file, dependencies.h. Uh, when you uh, add uh, the line require dependencies.h uh, into your Chapel code, Chapel will see that, okay, this file has a .h uh, extension. So that means that when I translate this Chapel code to C, I'm going to convert this require into an include statement. So that way, when you get the C code, the C code, uh, when the C compiler is compiling the C code, uh, the com C compiler will know uh, that there is dependencies, the, the function definition is inside of dependencies uh, H, and it will see it right before the main code. So that's why you don't have to prototype it in C, only prototype it in, uh, in, in Chapel. Okay? So if you decide to put your function definition into a C code, like in this example, uh, then when you are compiling the Chapel code, so test.chpl, uh, the uh, require uh, dependencies.c uh, statement, require dependencies.c, will not get translated into an include statement because this is a C file. So there will be no include statement inside the, uh, the C code. And that means that without dependencies.h, without a prototype in C, uh, your compilation will break because the C compiler will not know where to find uh, this function, right? So hopefully it makes sense. So basically, in this case, when you include a function definition into a .c code, you also have to prototype it into a, uh, into a, in a uh, .h code, right? So in this case, you have, uh, you have to have uh, three pieces, uh, three, three input files in your compilation. And then it all compiles, not, it all com uh, compiles nicely. So you can also put C code into an external block in Chapel, but that requires a special uh, build of Chapel that usually we, 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 don't, uh, we don't build Chapel that way on, on, the, on the clusters. If there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself at any time and ask questions. If I don't see anything or hear anything, then I assume that it's all clear. So uh, C types, um, you probably noticed that when we declare the external C functions in Chapel, we're using 
C types in uh, defining the arguments and the functions themselves, right? So, for example, void and C integer. So, C integer is the C type for integer in Java. And so, the reason why we have to use C types when we define functions and arguments, uh, uh, C functions and arguments in Java, is because uh, the types in Java and in C are different. So, they have some overlap, but in general, they're different. So, that means that in general, your integer in C is different from uh, the way it uses memory is different from your integer in, in Chapel. And, uh, you know, there are lots of things, so how many bits and the order of bits and bytes, you know, other conventions. But the end, uh, end result is that you have to uh, define the C types properly when you use them from, uh, from Chapel. So both for regular variables and for pointer types. Um, so, and also, when you use these C types, um, sorry, when you call a C function from Chapel, uh, all arguments have to be initialized with the corresponding C type. Or these types can be converted from Chapel types to C on the fly. You'll see lots of examples very soon. Uh, so parallel safety, uh, when, as I mentioned, when you call C functions from Chapel, these functions are zero. And you have to be aware on, on of when and how you call them. So you can run into problems if you make assumptions that are not valid. So just a couple of examples. If you are using a, a, a variable that you define in your chapel code, so it's a chapel variable, and then you're launching some additional threads, uh, perhaps you're doing multi-node parallelism or additional threads on the current node, uh, then inside those threads, uh, you might have a local copy, a different copy, of, of the same global variable. And then you can assume that, uh, you know, you just pass this variable to the SQL, but it's actually a different variable, right? So you have to be careful uh, which, which variable, which instance of a variable, uh, depending on the context, you pass to the C code. And uh, C pointers, so you'll see some examples for C pointers very soon. Uh, C pointers, they are just memory addresses, right? So when you pass a C pointer to a C, uh, sorry, to, let's say you copy a C pointer to a different node, uh, it will be useless there because a C pointer it only works within you know, the shared memory context because it's pointing to something stored in memory, but on a different node, that value is just going to be meaningless. So things like that you have to be aware of when, when you include C codes from uh, use C, C functions from Chapel. So let's go uh, to some examples. Uh, these will actually demonstrate very nicely how you can pass variables and, and pointers to uh, C functions. Let's just start from a very simple example where we have this function uh, print squared uh, defined inside dependencies of h, and by simply uh, passing an integer variable and we're printing its, its square, we're not returning anything from this function. And then in the main chapel code, uh, the variable is defined as an c integer variable, and then we just pass it to, to the c function, right? So exactly the same as, as in c. So the only difference is that you also have to uh, declare the external uh, procedure with uh, this, uh, this definition where you have to describe the types properly. All right, so this is a call by value. We're not modifying the value of the argument. If you want to modify the value of the argument, well, in C, you would do call by reference, where inside the function, the C function, you have a pointer as an argument, right? And then whatever this pointer is pointing at will be incremented by one. So we're going to use the same C code from, uh, from Chapel. So here we have, um, we are passing a variable, uh, not a pointer, but a variable, even though the function is expecting a pointer. But uh, the reason this works is because we put it at this function with a reference uh, statement, with a reference int intent. So that means then when we actually use this function increment, whatever we're passing, so we're passing the variable, but it's actually the pointer to this variable that's going to go into the C function. Okay, uh, so here is a similar example with an array. We have uh, this uh, reverse function where that simply takes a one-dimensional array of a size length, and then it reverses this array. So a very simple algorithm where we simply cycle through all elements from, uh, from, from the beginning to the middle of the array, and then we're swapping uh, the first and the last elements, second element and the second last element, and so on. And uh, uh, this function takes, uh, takes a pointer to the array, uh, to the array. And then we are passing the pointer to the array. So in Chapel, well, in C and in Chapel, uh, the, the array name is just going to be a pointer to its first element, right? So it works exactly the same way as, as in, as in uh, C. So in this case, we're actually passing a pointer. So the array name is the pointer. And we are uh, declaring 
declaring the first argument as a pointer. So C X as a uh, C, C, uh, C pointer to a C float. And it works. So when you run this code, we have the original array and then the resulting reversed uh, array. Uh, now uh, let's call this function uh, somewhat differently. So it's exactly the same external function. Here, uh, dependencies of H is exactly the same. But here, instead of passing the pointer, we're passing the first element. So you see, I have these. Uh, now it's a different array. So instead of a, um, a fixed size array of, uh, well, instead of a, 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 a C array, a, a C style array, we just have a native uh, chapel array uh, where the indices uh, this time run from 1 to 10. And it's an array of uh, C flows. And then we're passing the first element of this array. So this is um, passing by reference in chapel. We're passing the first element, not, not a pointer, but we declare the first argument in function prototype as a reference uh, reference style argument, right? So when this uh, this this uh, argument, sorry, when uh, this value b of one, this element uh, goes into the C function, it's actually the pointer that gets passed into this function. So this works as well. And uh, when we run this code, it just it just uh, prints the reverse array. Here's an example of a multi-dimensional array with a two-dimensional array. So here again, uh, the array is waiting for a pointer. Uh, sorry, the function is waiting for a pointer to this uh, two-dimensional array. And then we declare a two-dimensional array in chapel and we're passing the first element of this array. And then in function prototype, uh, we have to make sure that we declare this argument as a reference variable. And then when we actually run this code, you see that the array gets initialized exactly the way we coded it uh, in, in the C function. Okay, uh, so that's it for the basic examples. And then we're going to uh, switch to libraries because uh, these libraries underneath will use, um, well, uh, they were coded in, well, either C or uh, in, in LayPack. Uh, with LayPack, it's in, in Fortune 90. But we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be um, loading functions uh, from external libraries. And uh, first, uh, in SCF, we're going to uh, be loading these functions directly. And then which uh, HDF5 and linear algebra examples will actually use high level functions to load the underlying uh, C libraries and, and Fortran 90 libraries. So uh, when you run a, a large code and if you output a lot of data from this code, it's really a good idea, as you probably know, not to write this output as text because it's just too inefficient by factor of four or five compared to binary, right? Both in terms of uh, disk space used and bandwidth uh, to, well, IO bandwidth. So you really want to write this data as binary, but binary by itself is not portable. There are lots of things like, uh, well, first of all, binary uh, data uh, doesn't have any metadata. So when uh, you try to read it in some other tool or some other language, uh, when uh, the reader will have no idea how how uh, this binary is structured, right? So how many variables, how many dimensions, you know, the order of bytes, endianness, um, the number of uh, the, the precision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, you really want to use uh, one of these scientific uh, file formats. So for multidimensional arrays, the industry standards are NetCDF and HDF5. If you are doing a lot of visualization or if you're working with unstructured arrays, then you might find that VTK is useful. But uh, these libraries offer a lot of benefits. So first of all, the store data is binary, which is much better than text. And also they're portable across uh, different compilers, different operating systems, different platforms. So that means that if you create, let's say, an SCDF file on a supercomputer, you can just copy to your laptop, open it in, let's say, Paraview, and you'll be able to, Paraview will be able to understand it uh, right away without any problem, right? So they're portable. They have built-in data compression. Uh, they uh, uh, allow random access in the sense that if you have a very large, let's say, an SCDF file, you can actually access some elements without having to read the whole thing. And then uh, they also support parallel I.O. So uh, one of the examples I'm going to show you has parallel I.O. with HDF5, whereas NetCDF in Chapel still does not support parallel I.O., but I'm sure it's coming in, in the, the next few years. So in Chapel, both NetCDF, five, NetCDF and HDF5 are provided as package modules, and that means that when you use them, you have to actually load them with the use statement, like that. Actually, yeah, here I have an example. So example is in the next slide. And uh, when you call NetCDF functions, um, so C NetCDF functions from Chapel, you have to, when you're describing your uh, data set to NetCDF, you have to use one of the uh, standard C definitions for uh, the NetCDF type. For example, 
uh, NC float for a single precision array, NC double for double precision array, and so on. But that's exactly the same way you would do it in C and other languages. So here's an example. Uh, it's a, the shortest possible example I could compile. Uh, I, I could uh, show you in Net, uh, in, in Chapel with NetCDF because NetCDF by itself, its interface uh, is API in all languages, so C, Fortran, Python, R. Uh, it's very fairly, fairly low level, I find so that you end up uh, having to call a lot of functions. But uh, it's, it's fairly obvious what these things do. So let's just uh, walk quickly through this code. So here I'm defining a uh, two-dimensional array of size 300 by 300. So it's an array of C flows, right? So that single precision C variable. And then also define these IDs that are going to be useful for uh, defining dimensions. And also NCID is the file handler. Uh, so uh, these dim IDs uh, array uh, has two elements because we're dealing with a two-dimensional array, so one element for each, uh, sorry, one element for each dimension, and uh, then we're defining a two-dimensional array, which is just the sine function of x squared minus y squared inside a cube minus h, uh, sorry, inside the square minus h to plus h on each side. So it's a two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional array, and then we're simply opening the NetCDF file. So the file is going to be called 300 by 300.nc. And then we define the dimensions. So these uh, variables, x dimid and y dimid, are the handles for dimensions that pass to these dimids um, uh, uh, dimension ID, IDs array. And then uh, these uh, these arrays uh, used uh, when you define the variable itself in that CDF. So the variable is going to be called density. It's of type NC flow. That means a single precision, two dimensional. And then uh, these are the handles to well the the, the pointers to the uh, to the dimension array. And then uh, variable ID is the variable ID that you're going to use uh, in the next uh, call. So in the next call, we are uh, defining compression. So it's an optional line. Uh, but in NetCDF, you can actually compress your data set, and you will see the benefits of it in the next slide. So zero means no compression, and nine is maximum compression. And then uh, we have uh, a line that says that we are done defining the data set. And then the next line is we're actually writing the data. So we're using the file handle. And then the data is handled. And as you can see here, we're actually passing the first element of the array to the C function. So the reason we're doing this is because inside the uh, Chapel's uh, NetCDF um, uh, module, there is uh, so the uh, all functions there are C uh, prototypes uh, for uh, calling uh, NetCDF, C NetCDF from Chapel, right? So all those prototypes that you saw in the early examples. They just form the basis of this uh, CNET CDF module. All right, and then and then we we'll close the file. So that's it. So this is these are exactly the same C functions uh, you would call when you would be writing NET CDF from from a C code. And here's the result. So to compile this code, I actually have to have NET CDF installed on 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 the computer. So of course we have NET CDF installed on on the clusters, but here I'm just running this. It's a very simple code. I'm running on my laptop. And then, uh, so the code, uh, sorry, the data set is 300 squared and a single precision, so four bytes per number. And if you do the, the numbers, you will see that the amounts to 352 kilobytes, so plus the header. So that means that the net CDF file without compression will be roughly 360 uh, kilobytes, and it is. And if you turn on compression, so I'm using a highest level than compression, the file is actually significantly smaller, as you would expect. So that gives you, you know, the benefits of NetCDF, so portability and, and compression as well. So, and when you open this file, load this file in in, in Paraview, Paraview can understand NetCDF natively, and then you will see this, this mathematical function. So you see that the range goes from so it's a sign function. The range, go, range goes from minus one to plus one. So that's important to remember for the next example. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? All right, let's continue. So next, uh, we're going to take a look at the HDF5 library. So in HDF5, there are actually several modules, one of them submodules. One of them is uh, CHDF5, which provides exactly uh, the same uh, exactly the same idea. It provides uh, external C function um, uh, function type and constant prototypes for Chapel. So the way we saw it in NetCDF. But also in the upcoming Chapel 121, there is another submodule uh, inside HDF5, I.O. using MPI. And what it is, it includes several high-level uh, functions for reading and writing parallel HDF5 uh, files, which is great because Chapel is a parallel language, and we want to have the ability to do parallel I.O. from Chapel. 
So I'm going to show you an example right here. So this is actually the parallel code. Let's just walk slowly through. So here we are, it's a distributed memory code. So we are going to be running it on several nodes on a computing cluster. We'll be using a block structure distribution. So it's going to be a two-dimensional array partition into blocks and each block will go to a separate node. And then we're loading this HDF5 uh, IO using MPI module. So we have config variables that can actually cha uh, change from the command line without compilation. So we have a 300 by 300 uh, two-dimensional array, so the file name, and then h is just the number that goes into computing the function. So we have the uh, two-dimensional array, uh, size 300 by 300, offset loads, and it's distributed according to block distribution. Then uh, here, uh, so for all is a parallel loop where I'm cycling through all nodes that are participating, that I have access to in my code. And then on each node, I'm going to print the ID of this node. So when I run uh, uh, this code on four nodes, uh, these numbers will be uh, integers from 0 to 3, right? So integers from 0 to 3. And also for, so I'm printing node, then its ID from 0 to 3. And then a local subdomain is a function that shows me the range of indices of the array T that are stored on this node. So each corner will go to the respective node. There are four corners and four nodes, okay? And then we're defining the mathematical function. So here we're simply in parallel. I'm, I'm filling in all the values of, of t. So ij is just equal to that. So here the only difference from the NetCDF example is that to each value, I also add this integer. So local id is the number from 0 to 3 that tells me where the corresponding every uh, element is stored, one of, the, one of the four, in our case, one of the four nodes. Right? And then the final line is, uh, is writing the HDF5, it is writing our two-dimensional array into the HDF5 uh, file called 300 by 300.h5. And density is just the name of the variable that will be stored uh, as the name of our array inside the HDF5 file. So as you can see here we have, so first of all we have parallel IO already built in, and then we just have a single function call instead of the E function calls we had in the NetCDF example, right? Which is great. So this shows you, you know, the direction in which the uh, the I.O. libraries and in general, um, most libraries in Chapel are moving in, including more and more high level functions that will let you access all the beautiful parallel features of Chapel in a very high level fashion. Okay, so here we're uh, running the code. Uh, I'm running this code in my own uh, user space in the cluster. So I basically wrote my own script that loads a bunch of modules. It loads uh, the GCC module that I use to compile and the, this OpenMPI module that I use to compile my Chapel. So this is experimental, well, it's a development version of Chapel. So that's Chapel 121, right? So that's not the one we have installed in the clusters yet, but I think this version will install in a few months once it's, it's officially released. And uh, so here I'm submitting a job uh, that where I'm asking for, um, uh, where I'm asking for, so five minutes maximum runtime, I'm asking for four impaired tasks, but equally importantly, I'm also asking for four nodes minimal. So that will ensure that what I end up with is four CPUs each CPU will run an MPI task, and then each CPU will sit on, on its own uh, separate node, okay? And then I'm I simply asking 100 megabytes of memory per, uh, per each MPI task. I compile the code, and then I run it inside this interactive job on four nodes. And then here I have the output. So the, uh, the text output is each node prints its message, node uh, its number from zero to three. And then I see the range of indices that store the corresponding, uh, so basically it shows you which part of the two-dimensional array T is stored on the corresponding, uh, corresponding uh, node, right? And then uh, the last line of the code will write my HDF5 file that I load into Paraview. And those of you who work with HDF5 files in Paraview know that Paraview natively does not understand HDF5 files but there are many ways of loading them in, into, into Paraview. So one of them is you simply create an XML wrapper with the .sdmf ex extension. If you're curious, just send me an email. I'll be happy to provide you more details. And then you open this file inside Paraview, and you can see that here you have, in fact, you had parallel IO, you had a par uh, parallel data structure that was distributed across four nodes. Because you see that, so the colors are different and in the four corners, and then the range, instead of from minus one to one, we are adding an integer from zero to three, so the range now is from minus one to four. So we know that uh, parallel worked really beautifully and very well in, in this case. Okay. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about linear algebra, and uh, this is slightly different use case, so different from from IO. 
And so the idea here is that um, you have also a number of uh, linear algebra uh, linear algebra packages inside of Chapel. And uh, the one that I recommend to use is linear algebra. So the reason uh, why I recommend to use this one as opposed to uh, BLAST or LATEPAC that you can also load from, from Chapel is the linear algebra module is a high level module with functions, with parallel functions that might use BLAST or LATEPAC underneath if you need to use, for example, various solve uh, routines. Uh, so it will use a BLAST or LATEPAC for performance underneath but then it will also give you a parallel interface. So the functions that you can call from linear algebra, you can actually call them in parallel, which is fantastic. So uh, depending on what it is that you do inside of linear algebra, what kind of preparation, you might um, you might not need the blast and latex dependencies. Uh, the examples that I'm going to show you in the next few slides, so I ran some of these examples in serial on my laptop, some of them in parallel on the cluster. And on my laptop, what I had to do is, so in these examples, I actually had to use both Blast and LayPack. So on my Mac laptop, I had to use the Brew package manager to install uh, LayPack and Open Blast. And then when I compile my code, I had to I have to link it to the uh, to the uh, uh, respective libraries, so LayPack and, and Open Blast. And then uh, the examples on that I'm going to show you on the um, on the cluster, the parallel examples, they actually used uh, they didn't use LayPack, they used only Open Blast. So that's why when I compiled them, I loaded the Open Blast module and then I linked my chapel to the Open Blast library. Okay, so the linear algebra uh, functions, they work on both uh, dense and sparse arrays. And there are several dances of various useful operations. Uh, so, you know, things, the usual things like inverse linear solve, computing the eigenvalues, you know, various matrix uh, operations, so the dot and et cetera, et cetera. So they're all in there. And all of them are supposed to work in parallel. So I'm going to show you examples. The very first example is a serial example where we just take a square matrix and we compute the inverse of it. So here we have a mathematical, so a mathematical function uh, that is simply uh, given by, by this expression. So we're filling the element i g of the matrix E. So in this case, matrix A has default size 10 by 10, but you can actually modify it. This is a config variable from the command line when you call this, uh, when, when you run this code. Uh, so uh, A is a matrix. So this matrix function in Chapel, all it does, it just initializes a two-dimensional array. So this is not necessary. You can actually initialize this array in a standard way, uh, like you, you saw before in the early examples. But here we're doing it with a built-in matrix uh, function. And then uh, we are calculating the values. So we are calling our mathematical function same matrix. So then by printing the matrix array, and then we are calculating the inverse. So B is equal to inverse of A. And then we are also computing the product. And then when, when you print, when you run uh, this code and uh, you see the numbers, you will see that the product is exactly a unity matrix, exactly what it's supposed to be. Okay, so another serial example, and then we'll jump to parallel examples. So here we have a high, a high, high level, you know, linear salt, which is defining, so we're calling the linear algebra matrix. And uh, we're defining, again, it's a serial, uh, in this case, it's a two dimensional um, local array. So it's all run in a single thread, as a single process, single node. And then we're simply filling this array. And then we are also defining the right hand side of our uh, linear system of equations. And then I also define C, which is a copy of B. And the reason I define C is because at one time in, uh, in, in BLAST LATEPAC, the right hand side B vector is going to be workspace, it's going to be modified B. And then if I want to check the solution, I need a separate copy of C. Okay, so we have A and B defined, and then we simply solve, we'll call the solve uh, function from the linear algebra package, and then we print the solution, and then we'll print the check. Okay, and this works just beautifully. So if you run this, you will see that, uh, that uh, the solution is, uh, is, is very accurate. Okay, so uh, let me show you a couple of parallel examples that are a lot more interesting. So in this case, we are uh, computing Actually, it's not inverse. It's uh, it's the inner part of the distributed vector. So I should actually rename this function. It's not inverse, but it's a multiplication. So inner product of distributed vector. Here we have a space is a one-dimensional domain that is stored locally, but also we have uh, these um, distributed space. So it's a, a domain. It's a one-dimensional domain that is uh, demapped across multiple nodes. So it's distributed in chunks. So, it's, uh, so this um, one-dimensional array of a million elements is broken into chunks. 
depending on, so the number of chunks depends on how many processes you have in your runtime environment. Sorry, how many nodes you have in your runtime environment access to. And then each chunk will go to its own node. So it's a one-dimensional array that is uh, distributed across multiple nodes. And then on top of this distributed space uh, um, uh, domain, you have a one-dimensional array of reals. And then this is how we initialize. We simply uh, say that uh, the elements of the mean elements are gonna, uh, gonna have numbers one divided, sorry, I divided by a million, where I simply runs from one to a million. So we are, and that here, what I'm doing is I'm writing, I'm printing the distribution of this array. So I'm going to say A is distributed as, and then I'm cycling for all nodes. And then on each node, I'm going to be printing the range of indices that um, contain A on that particular, on that particular node. Right? Then I calculate, uh, so it's a vector, one dimensional vector. And then I uh, use the dot function in linear algebra that simply computes the inner product of the uh, of the uh, the array and one dimensional array and is transpose and then i also uh, compute the um, uh, the same inner product by a reduction operation so this is interesting uh, because this shows you that you have access to the same functionality using uh, di different uh, well uh, using uh, different different uh, you can access it in different ways so in the first case we're calling a built in dot functions at linear algebra and in the second case what we're doing so this is not using linear algebra, the, the last two lines. Uh, this is just built-in reduction, right? So we have a one-dimensional vector A, and we're computing A times itself, so uh, in the product, the dot product. And then we, uh, we have the plus reduction operation, which means that if this runs in parallel on multiple threads uh, or, or multiple nodes, then uh, each, each thread will do its own part of summation and then have individual sums and then the total sum is going to be reduced to a single number using the summation operation. Okay? So this example actually copied from uh, some other examples. I copied, modified them from uh, from the Chapel uh, standard uh, tests in their source code. So I'll show you the link in the very last slide to these. Okay, and then when we run this, so I run this both on a single node and on multiple nodes. So on a single node, we have this distributed array that has million elements. And in this case, it's actually not distributed because it's uh, it's a single node, right? So the array is stored as one dimensional array in, in memory on, on one, one node. And then we're computing the linear algebra product and the reduction product. And the speed is actually about the same for both of them, right? Because underneath what linear algebra uh, dot function will do, it will just do this, this reduction operation. And then in the second example, much more interesting, we are doing this in distributed fashion. So I'm running this on four, uh, four nodes. Uh, one processor on each node using 1,000 megabytes of memory. Then I'm uh, starting a chapel using unfollow calls in the, inside this interactive chart. And then I am uh, I see the output. So the output is A is distributed S. So you see these four blocks. So the one dimensional array was partitioned into four equal blocks. Each block was processed by, by, by the respective node. And then the result is exactly the same as we saw in the serial case. Here's an example of distributed linear solve. So um, here again, I have a two-dimensional array. So it's size 20 by 20. It's an array of rails. So that's a linear uh, system. The uh, left-hand side is E, the right-hand side is B, right? So A is simply a bunch of random numbers. So 20 by 20 random numbers from zero to one. And then B is uh, integer numbers from one to 20. And then I am printing the distribution of A B and X uh, on my uh, on my nodes, right? And so here I wrote a function that will print distribu distribution, so that uh, a procedure, so that so that I don't call the same well, the same uh, four lines over and over again. And then I'm simply saying X is equal to solve A and B, and let's run this again on a single node and then on four nodes. So when I run this on a single node. Uh, then you see I get my solution and all variables are local, right? Because, uh, so I have a two-dimensional array that is just local. So B is local, X is local, that makes sense. We just have a single thread, a single node. When I run it using four threads on four nodes, so one core, one core, one thread on each node, what this will do is, so A is distributed, B is distributed, then we're saying X is equal to solve A and B, right? And it turns out, so we get exactly the same solution as, as we should, and it turns out that X is also distributed. Right, which is great. So we actually, not only we have a parallel computation, 
So parallel computation in travel, computation always tries to follow your your storage. So the idea is that you try to minimize under, uh, the entire communication underneath as much as possible. So X uh, gets computed uh, in a in a in parallel in distributed fashion, fashion using four threads and four nodes, and also also stored as a distributed array in in the end, which is great. Okay. So in Chapel, the in addition to the linear algebra module, there is also a BLAS and LayPack package modules, and you can use those. So these will give you access respectively to BLAS and, and LayPack libraries. So these are you know fantastic industry standard libraries that have been around for, for a long, long time. They're really high high uh, high uh, performing, very efficient libraries, but they're serial libraries, right? So uh, both Bla uh, BLAS and LayPack uh, cannot uh, use Chapel parallelism. So that means that if you call them from uh, from a serial code, well, that from the serial chapel code is fine, but be careful when you call this uh, from from parallel chapel codes because you can run into problems. So much better approach is to use the linear algebra package that will call glass and lay back underneath. Okay, and that will give you you know much much easier uh, simpler interface inside your chapel code, and also you get a uh, bonus parallelism. Okay, so I'm going to show the last slide, uh, and then I will open the floor for questions. Uh, so all I learned, all I'm, uh, I showed you uh, today, I learned from the chapel documentation and also from their source code. So uh, inside the source code, there are actually a lot of very useful examples. So if you clone the, the full chapel source code, and if you go into the test, um, uh, test um, subdirectory, into library packages, then you will see lots of Lots of sub directories for NetCDF, HDF5, you know, BLAST, LayPack, Linear Algebra, et cetera, et cetera. And there are great examples. So if you're interested in a particular uh, library, uh, go there and, and see how that library or those functions can be used uh, from Chapel. So official uh, latest uh, 1.20 Chapel documentation is, is linked here. And then I find that it's actually really useful to look at the upcoming documentation, so the uh, pre-release documentation, because it, you can see how quickly Chapel evolves. So there's a lot more stuff there compared to you know, 120. So that's really great. The language is under very active development. And uh, that means that a lot more high level functions, uh, similar to HDF5 and linear alpha functions that I showed you today, are coming in the near future. So I think here I will stop. And if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or simply type your questions into the chat window. I have a question. Yeah, hi, how are you? Um, yeah, I was wondering why uh, MPI is faster if uh, Chapel code already runs as, uh, at the speed of C. So I was wondering if it's because the, the parallelization is not optimized? Yeah, so um, I think I was not clear. So MPI is not faster. So the reason why, uh, the reason why uh, complex Chapel code are somewhat a little bit slower than complex similar MPI codes is because a chapel will do all this optimization for you automatically. And automatic optimization might just not be as efficient as manual optimization in, in, in many cases because but, as, as but, a in the, mm -hmm. but in the case of task parallelism, you can tune things up yourself, can't you? So oh, yeah, why sure, sure. No, so yes, absolutely. For simple codes, for simple codes, you will get exactly the same performance as C with MPI, yes. Okay. But for very complex codes, it's just Chapel does all that optimization for you and all message passing uh, automatically for you. So, you know, you don't even send any messages in Chapel, right? So it decides right. that, okay, I have this array where I need to exchange right, information right, 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 right. around any other border, and then uh, I'm going to send messages, and maybe the way it sends messages is just not optimal compared to how we do that as a programmer who really knows your end, you know, physical problem. So. Okay, but in theory, if you were doing task parallelism in Chapel, yes. you could, in theory, tweak it to the speed of MPI. Yeah, yeah, I okay. think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Alex, um, I have a question. Sure. You mentioned about uh, interaction with C. You didn't say anything about C++. Is there, is there uh, much work about that? Or is uh, not just so? Uh, so I don't know. I have not looked into into this specifically. Uh, I, I just don't know. So I'm afraid to say anything. But what it can do always, if you have a C++ library or a function, you can always call it through C, right? So right. you can call it through C and then through C++. So there will be an additional step, but it's fairly easy to do. 
Right. So I, I just I have not looked at C plus plus inter interoperability. So I don't right. It's just that C plus plus also uh, sometimes you can uh, you know com um, with MPI you can you can use the advantages of classes right. with MPI and oh, yes, but I was wondering if people have done some uh, some in this. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, yeah. So uh, you can define your own classes in Chapel. Mm -hmm. And I suspect so when you compile your C++ code into a, let's say, a library or into an object file, uh, you can use it in exactly the same way you would use, for example, LayPath. So LayPath library was written in Fortran 90, right? But once it's compiled to, you know, to the end user, whatever is calling LayPath, it doesn't really matter what LayPath was written in. It's just an object file that expects, you know, a pointer or a value. So <clears throat> I assume when you have a C++, uh, C++ code or a C++ library compiled, it's just there is no difference, uh, so you don't know that it's C++. So the only difference, as you said, is that you can have access to much more complex uh, classes, but you can define your own classes in Chapel, and I, I just haven't looked at this, but I assume you can define your own classes in Chapel that will match, as long as they match the uh, corresponding C++ classes, you should be able to pass them to the C++ functions without any problem. So I don't I don't assume any, any, any you know, major problems there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for attending today. If there are no further questions, uh, the next webinar is going to be in two weeks. And uh, if we have uh, to make any changes, switch to different platforms, so internally in Compute Canada, we've had some discussions of switching to Zoom because uh, we have some recently in the past series we had issues with video. We'll uh, let all registered participants know in advance, but uh, right now we're still uh, on track for the next uh, next webinar is in two weeks, and I believe it's going to be on the GNU, uh, sorry, on, uh, on GNU plot, GNU plot uh, plotting library from 1980s that is still very useful today. So. Thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah, please. Question the, the last. Uh, so this presentation has been recorded. How do we access? Yes, I can show you. So uh, let me let me uh, minimize this, and I will open a new browser window. I'll just show you what to access the recording. So the recording, once it's this process, and that takes about one or two weeks, uh, because the video is going to be processed by one of our video guys. Uh, so if you go to westgrid.ca, mm -hmm. I just a second. And then you go click on user training right here in the middle. User training, mm -hmm. the gray box. And that will take you to our user training website. And here, if you go to programming, so Chapel is under programming, go to programming, and then you'll see Chapel in the menu. So we just click on Chapel in the uh, table of contents. And then here we have a list of different Chapel webinars. So the one that is, uh, that is today, uh, the recording is going to be posted probably in about 10 days or so mm -hmm. right here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, and the slides are here as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody, and see you in a couple of weeks.